Hello. Thank you for attending this session. Uh, I've entitled it uh, Narcolepsy as we age because uh, narcolepsy changes over a lifetime. And I thought I'd try to uh, illustrate some of those differences uh, at various ages as we uh, get older. So first of all, uh, let me just show you this. This is some data we collected some years ago. It's on nearly a thousand patients with narcolepsy. And we looked at the age at onset uh, uh, of symptoms and also the age at diagnosis. So the age at onset of symptoms is in blue. And you can see there's a real big peak. That's a, actually at a median of uh, 16 years of age. And um, in red is the age of diagnosis. And you see the peak there is, was actually about 33. So a big difference between uh, when symptoms first began and when a patient got a diagnosis. So you can see that 50% of people develop narcolepsy before the age of 16. And you can see that in the blue bars. But uh, for the majority, it's, it's only when they become adults that they actually get a diagnosis. So there's uh, many years there where patients are dealing with symptoms. And we know that uh, narcolepsy in childhood is uh, quite different to narcolepsy in adulthood. So there are changes. The other thing I want to show is that you can see that on this slide, uh, we had uh, people between the ages of five and nine had the onset of narcolepsy. But we do know from um, other reports that really it can begin from infancy. So, uh, you know, very early age of onset for many patients. And then there is uh, at the other end of the scale there, you can see that there were patients up to the age of uh, nearly 70 who developed narcolepsy for the first time, first onset of symptoms. So narcolepsy can develop at any age from infancy through to old age, but the median age is 16. So 50% of people are going to have symptoms before the age of 16. Now, the, as we uh, uh, have narcolepsy over our lifetime, there can be uh, associations with many other conditions that sort of uh, interact and uh, can make, uh, well, when they occur at the beginning, they can make the diagnosis more difficult, but uh, they also need to be treated, many of these, uh, as one gets into adulthood. So that sort of complicates the management of narcolepsy. So you can see that obstructive apnea can occur, and particularly in uh, patients that may be overweight, can occur in children, but more likely to occur in uh, middle age. Then there's uh, periodic limb movement disorder, a lot of movement activity that occurs that contributes to the sleep disruption that we see in narcolepsy. REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out in sleep. This is more commonly seen actually in children uh, with narcolepsy, but does occur in adult, adults as well. And similarly with the sleepwalking, night terrors, those sort of parasomnias, again, more likely to occur in, the, in children uh, that's when they occur if you don't have narcolepsy, and of course they can occur when you do have narcolepsy. Then there's uh, weight gain. We do know that there's often a uh, rapid gain of weight after the onset. Again, we tend to see this a little bit more commonly in the pediatric age group rather than in the adult age group. But uh, adults tend to be overweight, uh, as you can see, and increase about 15% on average over controls. Then there are significant uh, associations with uh, uh, psychological and psychiatric disorders, such as depression and anxiety. The symptoms of narcolepsy overlap depression because, you know, tiredness, fatigue, common symptoms and depression. So there's a lot of overlap there. But what a lot of people don't realize is the anxiety disorders. And that can complicate treatment because if you have an anxiety disorder and you're using a weight-promoting agent, or an alerting medication, that can tend to exacerbate the anxiety disorder. So it does make it a little bit more difficult to, to manage. Again, these can occur in children, but more likely to occur in uh, young adulthood and, and into adults. Precocious puberty is something that we recognize in children can occur, as you can see between reports between 16 and 40% of children have precocious puberty. And 
if there's evidence of this, then an endocrinologist would need to be involved in the management of, uh, of the patient uh, along with the sleep specialist. And then there's some evidence for increased cardiovascular disorders. 41% uh, uh, of untreated patients tend to have high blood pressure and a higher percentage are on stimulants for their uh, narcolepsy. So the treatment is going to make a difference there as well. So this is uh, some data with regards to the H1N1 vaccination. And uh, I put this up to show you that, uh, you know, there are differences uh, in different age groups. Here you can see in red, it's the age group of 11 to 16. And what we saw was the development of narcolepsy after the H1N1 vaccination uh, back in 2009 but it was more common in 11 to 16. So there was something different in that particular age group. Seems like there was a greater predisposition, but you can see that, uh, you know, it could occur at any age, except for less commonly was there uh, vaccination induced narcolepsy in the uh, adult population. So this is something showing that children, uh, there's something different about children in terms of uh, having this more predisposition for developing an autoimmune response in face of the H1N1 vaccination. Now, uh, cataplexy we know is, is quite different in children. Um, it's quite different from adults, and this makes it more difficult to diagnose, and often the reason why many children don't get diagnosed, because the um, they can get sort of uh, the hypotonia, so the flattening of the face, uh, the drooping eyelids, the drooping of the head, but they also can get some hyperkinetic movements too. So they get a lot of grimacing. You can see that maybe in the top right-hand picture there. Uh, and there may be some tongue thrusting. So the tongue tends to move around more than we see in adults. Again, illustrated in the bottom right-hand picture there, a girl with uh, some tongue thrusting. So a lot of unusual uh, sort of facial expressions and uh, it, uh, it's not readily uh, uh, recognized uh, by people as being a feature of uh, narcolepsy. People aren't looking for that. They're looking for people to get weak and fall to the ground, but they're not looking for these abnormal uh, facial manifestations, but quite common in uh, pediatric uh, narcolepsy. So let's talk a little bit more about pediatric narcolepsy. As I mentioned, 50% of patients do develop symptoms before the age of 16. They do have the uh, excessive sleepiness, the cataplexy, and the nocturnal sleep disruption. Those I regard as the three major features of narcolepsy. So uh, uh, in the cataplexy, it's really abnormal REM phenomena of which cataplexy is sort of the most obvious manifestation of this. So in terms of the uh, sleepiness, it is different in children and adults because there may be hyperactivity. And uh, parents listening to this will probably uh, recognize that fact in their uh, child when they develop narcolepsy, that there is this increased activity as they get more tired. It, it actually occurs to a certain extent in normal children too, as they get more tired towards nighttime, they get a little bit hyperactive. But the problem with it is that very often it's the hyperactivity that comes to the attention of the physician. And very often, uh, because uh, narcolepsy is a relatively rare disorder, they don't think of narcolepsy, but think of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So children often get misdiagnosed as ADHD. The only good thing about that is that the treatment is somewhat similar because traditionally they are the standard traditional uh, stimulants used for ADHD. So the symptoms uh, can be helped, and particularly the sleepiness, but it may delay the recognition of, of the diagnosis of uh, narcolepsy. And it's an important diagnosis because we're, we're talking about a lifelong disorder. Children also tend to have a lot of sort of irritability and uh, what's called emotional dysregulation because they can be sort of up and down more frequently than uh, controlled children. Uh, and that may be partly related to the uh, fighting against the excessive daytime sleepiness. The cataplexy, uh, I mentioned the hypertonic and uh, hyperkinetic movements, the facial grimacing, tongue protrusion, but then also the flattening of the face uh, 
in the drooping of the eyelids, but there can also be uh, puppet-like movements. That's a term that's been applied to it because the children may be a little bit uncoordinated and sort of clumsy. It's something we see in adults too. Adults tend to report themselves as being more clumsy than uh, others. And uh, partly that's related to the weakness associated with the cataplexy. And that's part of the uh, feature too with these puppet-like movements that they get this intermittent sort of weakness that occurs that makes them sort of uh, very uncoordinated in their movements called puppet-like movements. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the sleepiness because it's often overlooked in children and um, it, uh, when it occurs, it may be a reoccurrence of daytime napping. So a child may has stopped napping and then if they start napping again, that you have to suspect that there may be something else going on. And uh, or nocturnal sleep can be prolonged sometimes. So uh, they may have you know, developed shortening of their sleep as they became older, but then suddenly they start to spend longer in bed. And then of course the motor hyperactivity, restlessness, irritability as we mentioned. And the cataplexy, as I mentioned, uh, and again, uh, the typical features are indicated on the slide. But uh, the other thing to look for in the pediatric age group that's a little bit different in the adults, you're not going to see it in adults so much, is this uh, weight gain. It is more common in children, so there can often be quite a substantial and rapid weight gain. And of course, there's that precocious puberty that I mentioned. And uh, it's important, of course, to recognize narcolepsy at an early age because we want to be able to try to improve uh, performance and uh, at school and in social interactions. And uh, you know, now that we've got uh, better treatments and uh, we're excited because we do have a, a new treatment that's FDA approved for children for uh, narcolepsy, um, Oxabate uh, is both uh, the uh, low sodium and the uh, um, regular sodium oxalate, both approved for children over the age of seven. So, so we, we do have, um, uh, we are getting more medications to be able to treat children and we're not so dependent upon those uh, traditional stimulants, which like uh, most medications, of course, they tend to have some side effects. And uh, if there's some anxiety there, they can worsen that. And uh, we're more concerned about the long-term effects of uh, traditional stimulants. So, if patients uh, take them for a long term. And typically, as I mentioned, there's this delay in diagnosis in the pediatric age group, uh, not being diagnosed typically until they get to be adults. And uh, most pediatricians don't know too much about narcolepsy. And uh, so it's hard for them to make this diagnosis. And that's why uh, they often think of many other diagnoses like the ADHD before they think about narcolepsy. But if there is this uh, features that I've mentioned, then certainly a uh, child should see uh, a uh, sleep specialist and ideally a, a pediatric uh, sleep specialist. In terms of uh, treatment uh, tests that we do in children, it's a little bit different. Uh, we're more likely to do CSF hypercretin in children than in adults. So that uh, that can help, particularly if it's rather difficult to uh, diagnose. I mean, often children don't express symptoms as readily as adults do. And so uh, uh, having that CSF hypocretin, but it does require a spinal tap in order to get that. But it certainly can be very helpful if we're dealing with an atypical form of weakness and it's not clear is this narcolepsy or some other neurological disorder. There are subjective scales that have been designed for children, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale and the Narcolepsy Severity Scale. They're pediatric versions, makes it a little bit uh, easier for uh, uh, recognizing uh, these symptoms in, in childhood. The sleep studies are a little bit different. It's felt that the in a recent uh, study show that uh, you need the two sleep onset REM periods in order to make the diagnosis as you do in adults. But with the mean sleep latency in adults, it's less than eight minutes, but seems to be just slightly higher in children. So they've actually made a cutoff of 8.2 in children. So 8.2 or less is, uh, is uh, diagnostic for, for narcolepsy. Uh, 
But of course, there's often uh, false negatives. The MSLT is not perfect. Uh, up to 20% of MSLTs uh, can be uh, incorrect. So uh, it's a help, but uh, the most important thing really is the history. Then we come to the treatment and uh, treatment in children is uh, somewhat different to treatment in adults because we have such so fewer drugs uh, FDA approved. So as I mentioned earlier, it was quite exciting that oxabate uh, has been uh, approved. And so the lower sodium and regular sodium can be given to children seven years and, and up. And uh, the safety profile is similar to adults. In fact, uh, children, in my impression anyway, I believe that children actually seem to do a little better than adults uh, with oxabate. They uh, are, uh, don't have... Uh, uh, the sort of uh, negative uh, expectations that some adults may have got from searching the internet and reading uh, erroneous information about oxabate. So they, they actually adapt to, children adapt to oxabate very well. There's the traditional stimulus for narcolepsy. And of course they are approved for children uh, with ADHD. And so they can be uh, used and they're most commonly the medications used, but they only treat the, the sleepiness. They can have a little bit of positive effect uh, on uh, cataplexy if you reduce uh, the sleepiness, but uh, there are potential side effects, uh, particularly with time with them. And so, uh, you know, it's good that we're moving on to newer medications that may be more effective with a better safety profile. Modafinil is also uh, quite often used in children, but um, it was never FDA approved for children because there was uh, one case of uh, suspected Stevens-Johnson syndrome in children. And uh, so it was not approved. That's a very rare allergic type of reaction and uh, potentially can be fatal. So even though there was only one case of it that wasn't fatal, but uh, anyway, uh, it was felt that it was not uh, a good thing to approve modafinil in children. Um, the other drugs uh, there, patolicent and solriamfetol, these are the two newer drugs that we have for adults, but unfortunately not FDA approved uh, for children at, at this time. The important thing about uh, childhood uh, narcolepsy is, of course, making sure that their performance at school is going to be good. And so uh, there are some special education plans, 504 plans, individual education program plans, and uh, many school uh, uh, accommodations that uh, can be undertaken to help the child who has narcolepsy. And you can read here uh, at the bottom, you know, extra time and breaks for tests, help with note taking, uh, nap space, using uh, special recording devices such as smart pens, for example, having the teachers give them more uh, visual sort of uh, information or audio information to supplement the uh, schoolwork uh, can all be very helpful. Okay, so uh, talking about then uh, over time, I mean, many children do tend to develop uh, cataplexy at the time of their daytime sleepiness, but there can be quite a delay, and it may only be that excessive sleepiness, which makes it difficult, particularly in the adolescent, because the adolescent is um, uh, more likely to be sleep deprived, they're more likely to be up late at night, they can be on a uh, uh, computer or smartphones of course at night and they may cut themselves short of sleep so very often when you just have the sleep and as people tend to put it down to an inadequate amount of sleep or an irregular sleep wake pattern in the adolescent and, and unless they develop the cataplexy then obviously that very much helps and you can see here how cataplexy can develop over time so these are 127 narcolepsy patients that didn't have cataplexy and you can see the onset of cataplexy. Most commonly, it tends to occur within the, uh, uh, around the first six months if it's going to happen, but you can see that there, it can take up to over 20 years before a patient will develop cataplexy. So there's always a possibility. And um, that's one of the difficult things is that you've got a patient who has all the symptoms of narcolepsy and they can't get access to medications that are approved for type one narcolepsy. And uh, even though 
you know, subsequently they develop the features that make that diagnosis clear. So, you know, if they subsequently develop cataplexy, in my mind, they've always had type one narcolepsy from the beginning, even though they didn't have uh, cataplexy at the beginning. And uh, really the medications uh, that uh, are available for patients with narcolepsy and cataplexy should all be available equally to patients who don't have cataplexy because you just don't know at what stage they're going to develop it. And typically they do have other abnormal REM sleep phenomena, such as uh, the uh, sleep related hallucinations, the sleep paralysis, the vivid dreaming, the nightmares, bizarre dreams and different types of dreams. So there's a lot of other abnormal REM phenomena, but it's just the lack of cataplexy. And uh, uh, in my impression anyway, I don't think that's the prime reason why they should be denied treatment. So just talking about that, uh, you know, NT1 and NT2 and uh, narcolepsy, and then we have idiopathic hypersomnia. And um, I like this term uh, narcolepsy spectrum disorder, really covering these uh, three types. Idiopathic hypersomnia is a little bit different because there are sort of two types. And there's one type that looks like uh, narcolepsy. In fact, some people have... Uh, uh, feel that it should be combined with NT2 narcolepsy. So even though they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy and they don't have the two sleep onset REM periods or they have a mean sleep latency that doesn't, uh, uh, that may be a bit above eight, uh, for example, they, uh, they certainly uh, have otherwise all the features consistent with NT2 narcolepsy maybe a little bit less in the way of REM phenomena, such as sleep paralysis and the uh, sleep-related uh, hallucinations. But, so, but there is a subgroup there that can be combined. And as we know, and what this uh, illustration is showing is that there's a lot of crossover between these groups. The NT1 is pretty stable. Once you develop uh, type one narcolepsy, you pretty well stay uh, with the uh, same sort of features, although cataplexy may get a little less in time. But uh, if you repeat the uh, sleep testing, it tends to uh, be the same uh, time after time. Whereas in NT2, the sleep testing can vary. And um, so that uh, uh, it uh, they can change to be NT1 if they develop cataplexy or they can actually uh, change to idiopathic hypersomnia. And in some cases, there are cases of NT2 patients who symptoms have resolved over time completely. The majority of this isn't going to happen, but there are some where it has resolved. In the idiopathic hypersomnia, there's cases reported of patients who didn't meet the criteria for, for narcolepsy, but subsequently developed NT2 and then subsequently developed NT1. There's a fairly recent uh, uh, illustration that sort of highlights the features. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a sort of like a Venn diagram. And, and you can see it on the slide. And I really like this. This is a, a relatively recent development. And I think it was quite a smart move creating this. But you can see how the NT1 typically has the cataplexy and the uh, CSF, uh, uh, low CSF hypocretin level. And uh, that's the characteristics of NT1, whereas with idiopathic hypersomnia, some of them may have a long sleep time. There may be some circadian disruption, but they tend not to have the sleep onset REM periods on the sleep studies. And then there are a mix of features. As you can see, there's overlap between these disorders and uh, uh, the uh, sleep paralysis, sleep-related hallucinations, more on the NT2 and NT1, less likely to occur in idiopathic hypersomnia. Sleep inertia very commonly occurs with idiopathic hypersomnia, but sometimes can occur in NT2 and uh, unrefreshing naps in idiopathic hypersomnia again can occur in NT2, less likely to happen in NT1. So there's a lot of overlap of symptoms. And so in many ways, when we, uh, divide them up into these three groups. It's a sort of like a, um, a not, not an ideal thing because uh, uh, we, you know, there is so much overlap that really I like, as again, I like this uh, term narcolepsy spectrum disorder, which covers them all. So 
and uh, ideally patients should be eligible for all the medications that are available for this disorder. Okay, let's move from the uh, pediatric age group really to the adults now. And the, the specific thing in the adult uh, age group, of course, is college. And uh, there may need to be special accommodations at college. Again, as with the uh, younger uh, child, there can be this extra time for breaks, tests, help taking notes, and uh, the additional support things. They're all important in the college age child. And then uh, there's work in the adult, and uh, there are special needs there with regards to work breaks, designated uh, nap space for many patients uh, who continue to have symptoms. And then the uh, important thing, of course, uh, when uh, females with narcolepsy is uh, pregnancy. And uh, remember that 50% of patients with uh, narcolepsy are female. And in fact, uh, you know, some of the evidence we have suggests that it actually may be even more common in women than in males, but uh, we don't have clear evidence that it's more common in women than males, but certainly uh, it's at least 50% in females. And so uh, because it occurs uh, in uh, a young women, uh, then uh, pregnancy is a big concern. And uh, you know, when we look at that, it, we, there are concerns with regards to medications in terms of uh, around the time of conception, during the uh, pregnancy itself, at the time of delivery, and, and breastfeeding. So very special uh, precautions uh, and changes need to be taken uh, with regards to women in, in pregnancy. So with regards to the mother and the fetus, the uh, uh, Perceive, our current feeling about medications is that uh, taken in uh, approved doses, really there's no increased risk to, to women uh, of the medications for narcolepsy. The only proviso is mentioned on the bottom of the slide, it's modafinil and armodafinil, because uh, there is some evidence uh, that came out of Canada suggesting that there is an increase in risk to the fetus from, from these. Usually, uh, the most vulnerable period for the fetus is, uh, uh, is after uh, 18 to 60 days uh, around con conception. So it's really around conception and after conception that there's the biggest risk. Some women prefer to avoid medications for the first three months of uh, pregnancy and then take them in the latter stages of pregnancy. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's a concern about teratogenic risks, it's extremely low uh, for most of the medications. Any, uh, you know, proviso on that, as I mentioned, is with modafinil. And, and this data in the uh, Can Canadian data, they showed that there were 17.3% fetal malformations and uh, cardiac anomalies, uh, 3% uh, versus... Uh, 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 three percent in uh, women with that fetal malformations and women without narcolepsy, and one percent of cardiac anomalies and women with, without narcolepsy. So an increase seen in some data. So because of this, uh, it is recommended that women do not take uh, any of the modafinils at all during a pregnancy. Most for most women, it's preferable that they don't take any medication at all during pregnancy. But some women just need to take some medication. They're at greater risk of their narcolepsy without medication. And so typically we would recommend the lowest effective dose for most patients. Uh, and uh, so trying to reduce the medications down so that the patient's not greatly compromised by being on a lower dose, but able to function is often the best way uh, for many women with uh, narcolepsy. When it comes to delivery, there are concerns about whether uh, narcolepsy is going to impact on the, the delivery, but most women do have vaginal delivery without any complications. Um, really, there may be some uh, cataplexy that interferes with delivery, but that's extremely rare. And uh, if cesarean uh, is required for a woman, there are no increased risks in a narcolepsy uh, woman uh, because of having narcolepsy. 
Breastfeeding is uh, then the next uh, issue that comes up. And, and uh, in general, it's recommended hypnotics should not be used, sleeping pills, that is, should not be used in women who are breastfeeding because it, they can get into the breast milk and sedate the child. And really the same thing goes for oxabate. Uh, it's preferable that uh, women do not uh, give breast milk that contains oxabate to children. Um, the newer antidepressants that generally seem to be safe uh, uh, through pregnancy, the newer ones and uh, during breastfeeding. And um, again, also the stimulants, traditional stimulants and therapeutic uh, doses unlikely to adversely affect the infant. So if somebody has to take those in low doses, so that may be, uh, may be okay. But oxabate should be avoided. Many women tend to express milk before they take their dose of oxabate and use that to feed the baby during the night. And then the next morning, uh, eliminate, discard the first milk of the morning and then start breastfeeding the baby after that uh, so that the baby's not exposed to any uh, um, breast, uh, oxabate. Then uh, finally, let's move on to the issue of uh, elderly. And, um, in an analysis that looked at uh, a, uh, elderly patients with narcolepsy, it was found to get a later diagnosis. And, and this is probably because less was known about narcolepsy when they were young. I mean, nowadays there's much greater awareness. And so uh, patients now who get old are probably uh, not going to have this much older age of diagnosis. So, although there is still a significant delay, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Now, cataplexy, there's a lot of question about what happens to cataplexy as we get older. And uh, for some patients, they do say that cataplexy is less, less evident. And some patients even say it's resolved completely. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what's going on here. Certainly patients are less likely to put themselves in situations that are likely to... Uh, uh, precipitate cataplexy, and it may be just with age that they've learned to avoid those situations. But I think uh, despite that, my, my feeling is that there are some patients where there has been uh, a reduction of cataplexy, and it's not just related to avoiding uh, the typical situations that uh, precipitate it. So uh, in many cases, patients do report their cataplexy being most troublesome and worse at the time that it began. And uh, then as, uh, with time, it gets a little bit better. So there may be some lessening of cataplexy as uh, patients uh, get older. Sleepiness doesn't seem to change with age. So uh, elderly patients do tend to be just as sleepy and there. So there doesn't appear to be a, a reduction there. In the studies that have looked at elderly patients compared with controls, there have been higher mortality rates uh, we don't know exactly why that is. We know that there are a number of comorbidities and there are some cardiovascular comorbidities with narcolepsy. Maybe that's why there's a slightly higher mortality rate in patients with narcolepsy. But for most patients with narcolepsy, they can expect to live a uh, full and long life. Uh, the comorbidities uh, uh, occur, of course, in the elderly as they get older, and this is going to impact on the medication. So, you know, cardiovascular disorders, renal disorders, obstructive sleep apnea, much more common in the elderly. And that is going to make a difference to, to treatment in the medications that are used. And uh, it was found that uh, in a study, again, looking at the elderly, that uh, they tend to use stimulants more than other medications. But again, I think this is because they uh, had and narcolepsy from such an early age when stimulants were the sole treatment. And so they're more likely to have continued with stimulants for most of their life. Uh, and so that's why they seem to be quite common if you look at a cross section of elderly patients. But uh, I don't think that uh, uh, indicates that there's any uh, um, benef particular benefit of using those in the elderly. In fact, because of the cardiovascular disorders are increased in the elderly, there may be a disadvantage in, in using uh, stimulants at an older age. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop at that point, and I see we've got quite a few questions here, and uh, I'll see if we can 
get through in the time that we have available to us. And uh, so uh, let me uh, try to go through this. Uh, uh, do you, here's one question. Do you see more impactful cognitive performance problems and uh, of poor restorative sleep when patients have a long history and delays reaching, more delays reaching their narcolepsy diagnosis? Uh, what sleep specialty cognitive uh, rehabilitation options? You know, they, it's, a, it's very interesting uh, about uh, the cognitive impairment seen in narcolepsy. What we don't know is to what extent it's uh, related, uh, related to um, uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, the cognitive impairment is related to uh, the sleepiness or, or whether it's something independent of sleepiness. And um, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, my feeling is that there is something that is independent of the sleepiness that occurs. And so, uh, um, it, but the, we haven't got good ways of exploring this. And some people who have tried to look at this have uh, found that there's very... Uh, there's a lot of difficulty in being able to tease out if there is some cognitive impairment associated with narcolepsy. At the moment, uh, our idea is that if we can get good quality sleep at night, relieve the sleepiness during the daytime, then we can return people to pretty good cognitive functioning during the day. And even some patients uh, with newer treatments have said that they feel entirely normal again. So uh, I'm not sure that there really is some cognitive impairment that is independent of the sleepiness. Um, question here about narcolepsy in the perimenopausal time. Of course, that's a time when women are more likely to develop sleep apnea. So I think around the per perimenopausal time, one should be on the lookout for the development of sleep apnea. Very often weight is increased at that time. And uh, so any symptoms of sleep apnea, um, then, um, the person should uh, see their physician and be evaluated for that because if there is a significant amount of apnea, it may not be severe, but it may be mild, but treating it may actually add to the improvement seen with the narcolepsy medication. So it's important to recognize if sleep apnea is present. Um, <clears throat> some uh, physicians have said they don't like to see elderly patients on uh, oxabate. Um, I, uh, I don't see that there's a problem. I mean, studies have been done with oxabate in the elderly and the elderly have done very well with oxabate. I mean, it's like any medication, you're going to look for any adverse effects, but uh, the benefits of oxabate are so great that uh, to deny it on the possibility that there could be some uh, concern about taking in the elderly is not good, I, I don't think. And um, so uh, there certainly uh, a sodium oxabate is got a, quite a large sodium load. And in the elderly patient, that sodium may uh, add to cardiovascular issues or renal problems that are more common in the elderly. So that could be a concern, but with the newer low sodium uh, form of oxabate, that could give an alternative to take then. Uh, but I think the benefits of oxabate are so great and have been shown to be so great in the elderly that, uh, um, you know, if you can get around the uh, renal and cardiovascular issues or any other side effect issue, then uh, it's a good medication for the elderly. Are memory issues more of a concern with people as they age? Uh, um, I, I'm I think memory issues are a problem for anyone, whether they have narcolepsy or not. And so they are concerned for everybody. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you're tired and sleepy, it's not going to help with regards to your memory. So uh, getting optimum treatment, I think, is the most important thing as you get older. And uh, sometimes early people tend not to want to go and see physicians so commonly. But I think it's very important now that we have amazing um, new drugs becoming available and some very exciting ones that are potentially going to come available over the next few years that uh, it's important for elderly people keep in contact with their sleep specialists because there can be uh, new medications that could really make a big difference. 
Um, <clears throat> Somebody's asking about uh, the hyperkinesis in children. Could it be related to the hypothalamic uh, abnormality? I mean, I think it is related to the hypothalamic abnormality, but there's no evidence. They're asking whether the hypothalamic abnormality fades over time, but there's no evidence that there's a return of uh, hypocretin or orexin cells. We know that those are the cells that are destroyed in the autoimmune process of uh, narcolepsy, so, uh, but uh, they don't tend to uh, get better with time, unfortunately, but, uh, uh, but I think the hyperkinesis is all part of how um, a loss of hypocretin affects uh, children. <clears throat> uh, the question about, uh, because of the H1N1 vaccine causing narcolepsy, what about children and COVID-19? No evidence in it. And there, there is good evidence of why the H1N1 vaccine caused uh, um, narcolepsy. And it was in Scandinavia, not in the United States, because it was their particular form of the vaccine. But there's absolutely no evidence that the same thing is going to happen with the COVID-19 vaccine. And, and I would, uh, I think the, the potential risks of COVID-19 are much greater than any very remote possibility of a problem related to the uh, vaccine. So I would strongly encourage anyone to, to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, somebody's asking, uh, what are the long-term effects of using medications for 57 years or so? Uh, I, uh, Ritalin and Provigil. We don't know with regards to ProVigil, it certainly hasn't been out there very long, but I, I certainly have concerns about the traditional stimulants, methylphenidate and amphetamines. I think they do uh, tend to alter receptors. And because these are medications that have wide ranging effects throughout the body, I, I am concerned about uh, long-term uh, side effects, cardiovascular, psychological effects from the traditional stimulants. And so I think now that we have more specific medications, if people can avoid those traditional stimulants, I think all the better. Um, <clears throat> uh, so there's somebody is asking a question about the narcolepsy spectrum disorder and uh, uh, about removing the narcolepsy diagnosis from NT2 and classifying as having idiopathic uh, uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. You know, the problem is that when you start creating new terms for uh, uh, sleep disorders, the insurance current companies don't follow along. And unfortunately, over time, what we've found is because we have a lot of newer medications that are really quite expensive, that um, there is a concern uh, about people having access to these medications. So I think uh, keeping within that narcolepsy uh, terminology, maybe narcolepsy spectrum, uh, I think uh, is, uh, uh, is important. And, and I don't think we should start creating a, a new uh, diagnosis. Question is, uh, what age uh, is the elderly? It's a great question. As I get older, it, it gets much older, the, <laughs> the age, uh, but... Uh, you know, I, th I think when we're looking at most medications, very often there's a cutoff of around 65. So uh, with medications, so maybe we use that, but I don't believe 65 is elderly. Is there, um, I, I think we've only got a, a few minutes less uh, here. Uh, somebody's asking about increased uh, fetal risk uh, with methylphenidate. No evidence uh, for that that I'm aware of. Uh, increase, um, long acting versus immediate release. But again, uh, I don't see any uh, evidence for that. Is there a benefit of high, so of high sodium and oxalate? Uh, benefit? I don't know that there's benefit. I mean, uh, the benefit was having uh, oxalate available to us in, uh, in a so high sodium form, but, uh, it, uh, uh, but uh, actually, uh, is there any benefit? The only benefit I, I could potentially think as if somebody has autonomic dysfunction and some patients with narcolepsy do have uh, POTS disease and may have uh, um, hypo uh, uh, 
uh, valemia and low blood pressure, and maybe the sodium and sodium oxalate could be beneficial in those patients, but there's no data on that whatsoever. Any research on curing narcolepsy? Great question. Unfortunately, no, but boy, I mean, if any disorder, because it's a very specific abnormality present here, I mean, if any disorder potentially could have a cure in the future, then narcolepsy should, because we know it's a very specific cell type that's uh, been destroyed, but, uh, uh, you know, we'd have to wait. But at the moment, we're not looking for any, uh, and any evidence for a cure for narcolepsy. Well, look, I thank you very much, and I appreciate you for attending this uh, presentation. Thank you.